This is part two in our series of lectures on section 3.4 dealing with ordering relations. In this lecture we're going to talk about least upper bound and greatest lower bound relative to a given partial order. We first make the following preliminary definitions. Suppose we have a set A and we have a partial order R defined on A and we give ourselves a subset B of the entire set A and we give ourselves a point A in A. Then we refer to this A as being an upper bound for B provided for all B in capital B, B relates to A. So R is a partial order and so think of it as being something about comparing sizes. So let me refer to it as less than or equal to just for simplicity. So what this is saying is that A is an upper bound for set B provided every element of B is less than or equal to A. That's essentially what it's saying. And A is a lower bound for B provided every element of B is greater than or equal to A. Okay, that's essentially the meaning of it. Well, now we're ready to say what we mean by least upper bound of B and greatest lower bound of B. So, once again, R is a partial order on a set A, B is a subset, and A is an element of A. Then we call A the least upper bound of B, and we also refer to it as the supremum of B, provided we have the following two properties. First of all, A should be an upper bound, and secondly, given any other upper bound, uh, A is less than or equal to that upper bound. In other words, it's the smallest of all possible upper bounds where we measure smallness by the partial order R. We can similarly define what we mean by greatest lower bound, so we have exactly the same setup. We have a partial order on a set A, B is a subset of A, and A is an element of A. We call A the greatest lower bound of B, or we also refer to it as the infimum of B, provided First of all, it is a lower bound for B. In other words, it's less than or equal to everything in B. But secondly, um, it's greater than or equal to any other lower bound of B. So it's the greatest of all of the possible lower bounds for B. A shorthand for referring to the supremum and infimum of B are sup of B and inf of B. Now, just because we define them, it doesn't mean that we know they exist. We'll see some examples to indicate that they sometimes don't exist at all. But notice that in order for it to exist, it has to be an element of A. One thing we can prove is that if the supremum of a set B does exist, then it is unique. There can only be one supremum of a set, and that's because if you had two different elements, both of which um, satisfied the requirements to be the supremum, then first of all, they both would be upper bounds, and secondly, each one would be less than or equal to the other one, um, because it's, they're each the least of all possible upper bounds, and so by anti-symmetry, uh, they would both have to be equal to each other. So let's look at an example. Um, so in order to write down an example, I have to give you a set and I have to give you a partial order on it. So let's use the example of the order less than or equal to on the set of real numbers. I think that's the most familiar order to you. Okay, so here are several examples for you to try. Relative to this order relation on R, what is the supremum of this set? So what is the smallest real number? that is bigger than or equal to everything in this set? What is the biggest real number that's smaller than or equal to everything in this set? So let's begin with those two. The smallest real number that's bigger than everything in this set, of course, is 10. It's just the maximum, of the biggest element of that set. And the biggest element that is small, I'm sorry, the biggest real number that's smaller than or equal to everything in this set is the smallest thing of this set, namely 1. 
Now what about this? What is the supremum of this interval of real numbers? What is the smallest number that is bigger than or equal to everything in this set? It's 9. So notice that 9 is not an element of this set, but the supremum is 9. So it's not necessarily true that the supremum of a set is an element of that set. But I want to stress that the reason that 9 is the supremum is because, remember, this is a, an interval of real numbers. So the uh, numbers arbitrarily close to 9 to the left, all of the real numbers uh, arbitrarily close to 9 on the left, like, you know, 8.99999, um, things like that, you can get arbitrarily close in this set to 9 on the left. And therefore, if you're going to have an upper bound, you have to be bigger than or equal to 9. Because if you're smaller than 9, then there will be an element of this set that's bigger than it. And therefore, any number smaller than 9 is not an upper bound for this set. So, 9 is an upper bound, and anything bigger than 9 is an upper bound. And therefore, the least of all of the upper bounds, namely the supremum, must be 9. Now, what about the infimum of that set? It's 5, so this time 5 is an element of the set. So supremum and infimum may or may not be an element of the set. Now what about this one? This is saying the set of all things of the form 2 to the k as k varies over the set of natural numbers. So the supremum of that is what? Well, the elements of this set as k gets really big, 2 to the k gets big, so the elements get arbitrarily large. So there is no number that is, in, it, this set has no real numbers that are upper bounds for the set. And therefore, you might want to say that the supremum is plus infinity, but we've defined the supremum to be an element of the underlying set, and so there is no element that's an upper bound for this set at all, and therefore we would say that the supremum does not exist. Now what about this one? The set of things of the form 2 to the minus k, so that's like 2 to the minus 1, 2 to the minus 2, 2 to the minus 3, etc. You'll notice that as k increases, those numbers get smaller. So the infimum, or rather the supremum of that set, is the smallest upper bound. So the smallest upper bound is just simply going to be the biggest one in the set, which is the first one, namely 1 half. What about the infimum of that set? The infimum is the greatest of all the lower bounds. 0 is certainly a lower bound, because all of the numbers are positive. But given any positive number at all, uh, some epsilon positive, there will exist a k such that 1 over 2 to the k gets smaller than that, and therefore no positive number can be a lower bound for that sequence, and therefore the greatest of all of the lower bounds must be 0. And so that's the infimum. Let's now look at a different set. This time we're going to look at the power set of the set of integers from 1 to 10. That means all of the subsets of, the, of this set here. And the relation is going to be subset. That's the primary example of a partial order on a set. So relative to this partial order, what is the supremum of this set? So in other words, it's going to be some kind of an element of the power set. It's going to be a certain subset with the property that it's bigger than or equal to every one of these in the sense of subset. So in other words, it's going to be the smallest set you can write down such that every one of these is a subset of it. And so that's just simply going to be the union of these sets. And so there you see the supremum of that set. It's the union of those three sets. The infimum, on the other hand, is the greatest lower bound relative to this partial order. That means the set with the property that it's a subset of every one of these, but every set with that property should be a subset of the infimum. So in other words, it's the biggest set you can write down, which is simultaneously a subset of all three of these. Well, that's just simply going to be the intersection of all of them. And uh, the only element that's common to all three is 1. So the infimum relative to this partial order is the set singleton 1. 
Let's look at a different example. This time we're taking the set of natural numbers and we're using for our partial order divided by. These are all examples, by the way, of partial orders that we considered in an earlier lecture. So relative to this partial order, what are some upper bounds for this set of natural numbers? Well, we're not using the usual partial order of less than or equal to. So for example, 26 is not considered to be an upper bound of this set. Um, because 15 um, does not divide 26. So 15 is not viewed as being less than or equal to um, 26. And similarly, 25 doesn't divide 26 either. So 50, 26 is not an upper bound for that set. So the, the upper bounds for that set are precisely the natural numbers that are divisible both by 15 and 25. So in order to answer questions of this nature, it's best to write down the prime factorization of the two numbers. 15 is 3 times 5, 25 is 5 times 5. So the numbers that are going to be um, for which 15 and 25 divide are, are going to be the numbers that have at least the primes 3 and 5 in their prime factorization and at least two fives. So the smallest number you can get away with will have a 3, a 5, and one more 5. So 75 is certainly an upper bound, uh, but you can throw in, as long as you have a 3, a 5, and a 5, you can throw in anything else. You, uh, you can throw in other primes. It, no, in fact, you can throw in anything you want, just as long as you have 3, 5, and 5. But the supremum, namely the smallest, at least relative to this partial order, the smallest natural number, uh, which is an upper bound, is going to be this one, 3, 5, and 5, which is 75. It's also known as, it's more commonly known as the least common multiple of 15 and 25. But relative to this partial order, it is the supremum of, of that set of natural numbers. Now, what are the lower bounds of 15 and 25? So those are the, num those are the natural numbers that divide both 15 and 25, and the only, um, if you look at the primes, um, it can have a 3, it can have a 5, that would divide this, but if you had a 3, it wouldn't divide this. So the only um, integer uh, or natural number that will divide both 3 times 5 and 5 times 5 is 5, or of course 1 also works. So 1 and 5 are the only lower bounds, so the greatest lower bound must be 5. In other words, the infimum of that set is 5. And by the way, that's also the GCD of 15 and 25. So the GCD is the infimum of a set, and the LCM, the least common multiple, is the supremum of a subset of the natural numbers relative to this particular partial order. Now I'm looking ahead to something we're going to do shortly. Let's look at one last example. We're going to take the set of rational numbers and we're going to look at the ordinary less than or equal to. And I want you to look at the set of all r rational numbers whose square is smaller than 2. And can you imagine what should be the smallest uh, rational number relative to this order that is simultaneously bigger than or equal to everything in this set? What do you think it should be? Well, I claim it doesn't exist. The supremum does not exist. And, and why is that? Well, the idea is that if you take the set of all rational numbers whose square is less than 2, the supremum of that is trying to be a number with the property that when you square it, you actually get 2. And since we know that there is no rational number whose square is 2, because as we've proved earlier in the course, the square root of 2 is not rational. So, um, for that reason, we, we, I mean, we're just arguing intuitively here, but intuitively it feels like if there is a supremum of this set, it ought to be the number whose square is 2, and that is not a rational number, and therefore the supremum does not exist.